Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar about the Sangai Podocarpus Connectivity Corridor, the first in Ecuador. My name is Matt Clark. I am the CEO of Nature and Culture International, and I am your host this afternoon. Um, I'm seeing that many of you have already found the poll and answered the question about what is a connectivity corridor. I encourage you, if you haven't done that, to answer that. I am calling in today from the Oregon coast where it is an unusually beautiful day. It's, uh, the coast is very beautiful, but it's not often very sunny. Um, so we will pause for a few minutes to, to let some of the stragglers come in. Uh, in the meantime, uh, cast your votes for what is a connectivity corridor. And again, welcome to this webinar. I'm really looking forward to it. If you put in the chat function where you're where you're viewing from, I'll read out some of the where people are people are, are dialing in from. If you type that into the chat. From Cuenca, Ecuador, Pauline is from Cuenca, Ecuador. Hi, Pauline. San Luis Obispo, we have Bert. Hi, Bert and Candy. We have Nyla from San Diego. I have a compadre, Jim, who's from Battleground, Washington. Hi, Jim. Charles from Kansas City. Wonderful, this is so fun. Carlsbad, San Clemente, Washington, D.C. Wonderful to see people from all over the country and, and our neighbors to the continent to the south. That's wonderful. All right. Uh, for those of you who are just popping on, um, we have a poll, which we're going to shut down in a few minutes. I am Matt, uh, the CEO of Nature and Culture, and I'm your host today. Welcome, everybody. All right. I am going to take advantage and end the poll. So what do you think a connectivity corridor is? Connectivity corridor links two or more patches of habitat with each other, connects those together, facilitates movement between two or more patches of habitat. You can think of it as uh, similar to a hallway in your household, which connects your bedroom to your um, living room, to your dining room, to your kitchen, et cetera, all the places that you live. Why is a connectivity corridor, or why is ecological connectivity important? Uh, I'll give you two practical reasons. In the Andes, the trees at 2,000 meters uh, fruit at a different time of year than the trees at 500 meters. And if you are a spectacle bear, you need to eat year round. And so you need uh, corridors that connect you to those different, um, those different habitats, those different sources of food for you, those trees at different elevations. So that's one, uh, one reason that connectivity is important. Another example, if you are a young male spectacled bear, you have just reached adulthood, you need to out-migrate from the uh, habitat that you were born in in order to prevent inbreeding with one of your close relatives, a sister or an aunt. Um, inbreeding was not good for the uh, Egyptian pharaohs uh, and it's not good for spectacled bears. Um, connectivity actually has, has gained some prominence. The uh, United Nations, the nations of the world are in the process of renegotiating the Convention on Biological Diversity, which was originally ratified in 1992. These are known um, informally as the Aichi targets, which set, the, set targets for amounts of both terrestrial and marine land, or not land, but marine environments under conservation. It, this round, which we are now just renegotiating, connectivity is a much more important element than it was um, 30 years ago when they were originally being negotiated. So that's another example of how connectivity, connectivity is being recognized for, for its importance, its ecological importance. Uh, next slide, please. 
just some brief housekeeping. If you are having any technical technical difficulties, please type in the chat and we will try to help you get you back on track. And if you have any questions or comments, please also type those into the chat and we will compile those and uh, share those during a question and answer session at the end. Briefly, Nature and Culture International, I have the privilege of sharing you what we are. We are an international conservation organization. Our mission is to conserve the biological and cultural diversity of the Andes and Amazon ecosystems in South America, in Northern South America, as well as the subtropical dry forests of Mexico. These are among the most biologically and culturally diverse ecosystems in the world. And we do this in concert with indigenous and rural peoples who live in these landscapes and know them intimately. These are very important partners for us. Next slide, please. We do two things in a nutshell. We work to create protected areas, uh, meaning legally designate protected areas, primarily subnational protected areas. And you can see the slide at the left or the map at the left is uh, a number of the protected areas that we have helped to, to create. And then subsequent to their, their creation, we work to ensure their effective management by ensuring that they have effective governance structures, uh, sustainable financing mechanisms, they have adequate signage, they have rangers who patrol them, et cetera. And so in a nutshell, those are the two things that we do. Next slide, please. We take great pride, these are a number of our conservationists. We take great, great pride in the fact that our conservationists uh, are from the places that we help to conserve. To date, um, since our founding in 1996, we have uh, conserved more than 21 million acres, which for reference uh, is more than 10 times the size of Yellowstone National Park, if consolidated. We're very proud of that figure. We've supported 300 indigenous and local communities. created five water funds that provide sustainable financing and clean water um, for hundreds of thousands of people in, in uh, Northern South America and Mexico. And when you aggregate those 21 million acres, we estimate that more than 3 billion tons of carbon are stored in those forests. That is carbon that if those forests were lost, if they were cut down, that, the, that carbon would enter the atmosphere which is, so that's a radical amount of carbon that we are keeping out of the atmosphere. Encourage you to learn more about us at our website, natureandculture.org. We actually just did a website revamp, so go check that out. Even if you've looked at it before, go check that out and encourage you to sign up for our email list. Um, so without further ado, I am going to introduce our speaker today, who is a wonderful colleague and friend, Fabian Rodas. Fabian has been with Nature and Culture for 19 years. He started, he was trained as a biologist, and early in his career, he was doing um, wildlife research. Specifically, he was doing bird research, and he decided to switch his focus to conservation, identifying that without effective conservation, there would be nothing left to study. He has, in his 19 years with Nature and Culture, he's overseen some of our um, flagship projects, including the creation of the Foragua Water Fund in southern Ecuador, the creation of the um, Macizo Alcajas Biosphere Reserve, He's overseen many of the individual uh, protected areas within the Sangai Podocarpus corridor, which we will talk about more today. And he recently oversaw the creation, the designation of a national corridor that covers that entire area and becomes a, uh, an effective management structure for that area. In addition to uh, all of his wonderful accolades in the professional in the professional field. He is a wonderful photographer and he's a very smooth salsa dancer. 
Um, so without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Fabian. Uh, so take it away, my friend. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure for me to talk on behalf of many people that live here in this wonderful space in Southern Ecuador that now we call the Sangai Podocarpus Corridor. Um, but first, as an introduction, we prepare a video that I hope you enjoy. Located along the southern Andean mountain range of Ecuador lies the Sangai Podocarpus Connectivity Corridor, the first connectivity corridor in the country and one of the few of its kind in the world. Spanning more than 1.4 million acres of cloud forest and paramo grassland, the corridor protects one of the most biodiverse places on our planet, the tropical Andes. It connects protected areas, establishing habitat connectivity essential for far-ranging animals like the endangered mountain tapir and the spectacled bear. Here, new species of amphibians or reptiles are found in the corridor. We all depend on the conservation of this beautiful and vast landscape. The forest and paramo grassland sequester millions of tons of carbon, which helps mitigate global climate change. People living in and near the corridor depend on the water captured by its forests. Thank you. Um, first, let me tell you about the agenda of today. Uh, we will see what's a connectivity corridor. We will explore a little bit for a, by a photographical journey in the Sangai Podocarpus. I will tell you how to create, how we create the Sangai Podocarpus uh, corridor. What are our main achievements so far in this area? How we are managing this, this landscape? and how we are achieving conservation through this strategy or elements of success and what's next because we are sharing this information with other spaces too. Um, well, what's a connectivity corridor? Matt mentioned some of the reasons why uh, it's important to have a, a, a connectivity corridor. But let's, let's think that we have protected areas. Protected areas are our main conservation strategy around the world, but they are not enough in many places. It's, it's shown by science that when you have a protected area without connectivity, you are losing biodiversity, even if the measurements of conservation are very strong. So when ecosystems are connected and healthy, the life blooms inside. And now with the human impacts, um, fragmenting into smaller and smaller pieces, our ecosystem is very important to maintain them connected or to restore the connectivity. So a uh, connectivity corridor uh, by definition is a clearly defined geographical space that is governed and managed over long term to maintain or restore effective ecological connectivity. Um, you have to think in difference between these species on the, on the photos. It's not the same for a flower, for a mammal, or for an eagle uh, when you think on connectivity. So all the scales uh, for species must be considered. The next, please. Hey, Fabian, this is Matt. Would you, yes. turn, your, um, would you turn your video on so we can see your lovely smiley oh. face? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, thank you, Matt. Okay, um, so uh, what's uh, connectivity corridor again? In this uh, photo, you have um, two corridors, one for humans, one for wild nature. Um, it's critical to maintain the connection between um, the adequate habitats for a species uh, for humans, uh, like, like the road, for instance. So the ecological connectivity, another definition again, is the unimpeded movement of a species and the flow of natural process that sustain life on Earth. 
you can find um, a lot of information in this recent uh, book published by IUCN. It's only last year was published. You have uh, there a lot of examples of how it works around the world. The next, please. So we are getting into the Sangai Podocarpus corridor. We are placed in South America and the Northwest of South America. Uh, and there are many reasons why this is a very special area. First of all, we are around the equator. So uh, we have a lot of sun, um, a lot of sun radiation that allows more plant productivity. Um, we have different elevations in very short spaces uh, because of the Andes rise very, very fast, I will say, in, um, in, a small, uh, in a small areas. So you have more spaces, more microhabitats for, for um, speciation. So uh, evolution is happening all the time in different uh, conditions. So it, it's happening right now in the Sangai Polocarpus corridor. And wind currents, uh, we have um, moisture coming from the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean crashing to the Andes uh, Cordillera and then uh, bringing also some nutrients. For instance, uh, it's shown by, by science that we receive uh, sand from the Sahara des Desert. So it's uh, amazing the, the amount of uh, of kilometers that this kind of, of nutrients can uh, travel to reach the Andes. So uh, we are going to, uh, to see some photos uh, going from the upper part of the Sangai Podocarpus corridor. It's between 15,000 feet of elevation, so it's very high. In southern Ecuador, we don't have glaciers, so the Andes here are is lower in lower elevation than in other places, for instance, in the northern Ecuador or uh, Colombia or Peru. So in this area of southern Ecuador, we have lower Andes. So we don't have glaciers, but at some point we have, uh, during the glaciation age, we have a lot of ice that form this kind of lagoons that are reservoirs of water but also the soil is like a sponge of, of water. So if, um, if we lose, lose the condition, the physical condition of this soil that is very easy for compactation, for instance, when there's a lot of cattle uh, stepping on this, this soil, the water re uh, retaining capacity is lost. So it's very fragile. Um, it's very, very fragile. Uh, it's very cold, it's windy, uh, we have a lot of solar radiation there. Um, and the soil is also one of the uh, biggest um, storage of carbon in the world. In terms of ecosystems, we, we are in, in the top. Um, a native paramo that are in good conditions could have like 500 tons of carbon per hectare. It's very, very high. And as I say, it's fragile and you can lose all this carbon when a forest, uh, a fire comes or there's uh, agricultural activities. Next, please. Here, one of the biggest inhabitants of the Paramo, the, the Andean or spectacle bear. Uh, at the left, we have the male, at the right, the female. The sizes of this, this species is, um, uh, is very different in, on sexes. So the people here believe it to be two species, but it's only one. Only the male can cross fragmented habitats when you lose connectivity, but the female just remain in, in the place that uh, are connected. The male could, have, could be like two, uh, 200 kilograms and it's two times bigger than the female. Uh, they need like uh, 30,000 acres of habitat, the males. So it's important to uh, maintain a big spaces to protect these species. Um, yeah, here there is a, a poll. Um, and I know you are well informed. Uh, I would like to know what you think is the 
favorite food of the spectacle bear in the in the Andes. We have three options there, like fruit and bromeliads, honey and nuts, river fish and insects and mice. Okay, thank you. Yes, you are very well informed. So fruits and bromeliads, this is a mainly a frugivorous species of vegetarian. Um, it's considered um, a seed dispersal, seed disperser, uh, because um, can move um, for vast territories and take seeds from plants from one place to another and restore habitats and ecosystems. So it's very important the ecological uh, function of this species. In the photo, you have also the paramo again, and you can see a, a puya. That's a kind of bromelia. This is the same family of the pineapple. And it's one of the favorite foods of the Andean bear in the in the top of the Andes. Um, the next, please. So they just broke the plant and start eating inside and the core of the plant is very fresh, sweet and soft. The rest of the plant is very spiny and very dry. So um, this is part of the food of the of the Andean on the of the spectacle bear. So they have a lot of fiber. It's a good diet. As we are going down, uh, continuing with our um, journey to the from the through the corridor, we will find this um, uh, mountain forest. It's a kind of uh, very steep uh, slopes. Uh, there is a lot of biodiversity. Um, shelter in this forest. It's between 10,000 to 6,000 feet of elevation. Um, we have a lot of microhabitats and since then, then uh, a lot of biodiversity too. You can find, for instance, in one tree like this uh, that is shown in the, in the photo, you will find like 200 species of um, epiphytes including orchids, bromeliads, uh, lichens, and many more. So one tree can have a lot of life inside. Yes, the next place. We have many new species, many, many frogs, um, many birds. The next place. Yeah, very beautiful birds like tanagers, uh, hummingbirds. Um, and we have a lot of orchids, as I mentioned, and, and many, many more. The next, please. I would like to show you in, in this picture uh, one of the dynamics, natural dynamics of this kind of forest. You see the landslide, uh, it's, it's natural. So the steep slopes are frequently um, um, have perturbations, I would say, uh, for landslides. This, this is part of the um, renewal of the forest. So when you have a mature forest, you, you uh, reach the top of biodiversity at some, po some point. So the forest is not growing anymore, but then a landslide is opening a gap and also allowing the colonization of other kinds of species like secondary succession species. So, this uh, creates a microhabitat again to allow mm, the presence of other kind of, of biodiversity. So this is why this kind, one of the reasons why this kind of forest is very, very diverse. You can see the, um, uh, again, please, the, the last one, just one second. At the right of this uh, photo, you have a gigantic fern uh, this is uh, showing that the area is more tropical. It's not that as cold as the uh, in the upper part. The next one. We also have a lot of water in this uh, level of the forest. So we are here in an expedition through um, the new national park, uh, Rio Negro Sopladora. This is a national park NCI helped to create two, the, two years ago one of the core areas of the corridor. And we are going down again to in elevation. 
This is a landscape in the lower part. It's more tropical, it's more, more humid, warmer, and uh, between 6,000 feet to 2,500 feet, feet of elevation. Um, last time I did this journey through the corridor, uh, I went with my father, he's on the, on the photo. Uh, he's 73 years old and uh, he did this journey in, in three days of walk. So I was very glad uh, I did that with my father. The next one, please. Uh, one of the top predators of this area is our friend the jaguar. Um, of course, it's very important to protect the uh, populations of deers, of peccaries, um, and other uh, prey for this uh, this animal. So, the jaguar needs to have a lot of uh, food and population, a healthy, healthy population of the species they, they prey on. The next one, please. And other smaller animals like armadillos, for instance, in this uh, photo, you see a jaguar. It's a, a melanic jaguar that we call panther. And he's having a snack, an armadillo snack. The next one, please. In the lower part, you are seeing now um, not so steep slopes, flatter areas. And there's where um, the develop the develop, develop is uh, have come. I, I mean, in terms of roads, human settlements, uh, agriculture, pasture lands, more extensive pasture lands, uh, logging, and many more. So um, this area, in in some places, have lost the connectivity. It's very important to work with local people with uh, product uh, the with the uh, livelihoods and, and productive systems to restore the connectivity, uh, especially from the Andes to the lower Amazon. This is where the connection have been lost uh, now. And uh, this is part of our work too. The next one, please. So here's the map of Ecuador. And on green, you see the national system of protected areas. Um, we have some large areas, especially in the center and northern Andes, in the center of the country. I'll show you here. This is the Andes, and here are the, our larger protected areas. This is the Amazon and the coast. But if you see in the southern Andes of Ecuador, we have very few and small protected areas into the national system. This map is only national system. So we uh, suffered from this lack of protection for many years until we start creating a solution for that, working locally. So on red, now you see the corridor, the Sangai Polocarpus corridor, how, was it, how it was conceived and this is the area where we have been working for 10 years so far. So this is a new strategy that, um, because conservation wants to be implemented from the local vision, um, with local people uh, to protect this large landscape. The next one, please. Uh, how to create a corridor just piece by piece. You see on the animation, the years and the number of acres protected. On the map, you see how the reserves were created year after year, working with every municipality, with every community, with the Minister of Environment to achieve a large um, percentage of conservation of this area now. We are looking even on to the future, to 2024. Uh, so far, we have more than 1 million acres uh, created as protected areas, and the dark green are the areas that already are or will be in the national system of protected areas. This is the only way we can avoid the, for instance, mining or logging or other kind of impacts. So this is our projection. The next one. Thank you. So our rings on the corridor so far, more than 1 million acres of protected areas. 
We have a new national park. We have two community reserves also in the national system. So those are core areas and very re restricted to conservation. We have 12 municipal reserves from, from local uh, ordinances. And three of those 12 municipal reserves um, will go to the national system. So we will um, upgrade the conservation level during the next years. Um, the next, please. Here you see the Minister of, of Environment on 2018. He's, he's signing the presentation of the corridor, the dossier, he's signing the dossier, presenting the corridor, uh, Sangai Podocarpus, as the first one in, on the country. And, um, but he said, I cannot declare the area. So, because we don't have the national legislation. So NCI uh, was requested to support this uh, national legislation after uh, two years in 2020, 2020, we uh, have uh, enacted this uh, national law that allows now to create more corridors and to declare officially uh, for the national uh, system. So it's Ecuador is the first country doing that on the tropical Andes in many countries. So it, we are um, going ahead, I will say, uh, with this experience. The next one, please. So how does the corridor achieve conservation? Um, besides the area, physical area, besides the reserves, we have a lot of people there. We have a lot of institutions working there and uh, we have authorities there. So the academy, universities, the local governments, the Minister of Environment and many more are working together to, um, to uh, attack the main problem that we have. For instance, uh, this deforestation allows the people to take the cattle to the forest and the Andean bear, for instance, is living there the males can eat also on, on cattle, and, and this causes a problem for the people and also hunting uh, for the wild animals. So this group of people working enough to manage the area is finding better uh, ways, better um, uh, protection uh, systems and production productive systems to avoid this kind of conflicts. Understanding that the dynamics will deliver better recommendations for local authorities. The next one, please. We also, uh, this collaboration with uh, the academy and local governments um, at this landscape scale uh, is funding more and more biodiversity. Uh, this strengthened our um, importance of the corridor in terms of biodiversity nationally and internationally. And um, this will leverage more attention um, from the, not only um, national, but also international, and certainly, and hopefully, will attract more funds for conservation. This is very important to establish the importance of the area of the corridor uh, as a landscape protected, protecting biodiversity that's, that is a patrimony of all the world. The next one, please. So we have another question for you here. Um, how many species of amphibians do you think were discovered in Sangai Podocarpus last year? This is an area that uh, hasn't been uh, well explored in terms of biodiversity. We are just discovering the beauty and the richness of the area. So how many species of amphibians uh, that, that one that looks like a lizard is also an amphibian. It's a, um, yeah. It's, so, okay. Yes, 40% of you say 20, 20 species. Yes, around 20 species were discovered last year in Sangai Podocarpus for our expeditions of, um, of research. The next one, please. Uh, it's very it's very important that this um, discoveries um, deliver interest and uh, now we have a grant uh, research grant for exploring more of the richness of amphibians 
with a project that is that is supported by, by one of our uh, board members that we want to thank for, for this uh, kind support. Um, our elements of success, I think we have uh, several, um, especially this strategy of working bottom up. So our planning, our vision, our uh, approach to the area uh, comes from the um, knowledge of local people the vision of local people, the local governments, the local universities, they know the territory, they uh, use the ecosystem services that, that are being provided by the, the forest. So they want to, they, they must be involved in, in conservation. It's, this is a continuous process. It's not a project. We are working on that like 10 years. Um, so the projects are part of the process. And fortunately, we have had uh, many uh, donors that, that are very flexible and adaptive to the opportunities. So it's very, very important to have a continuous support uh, to, to take these opportunities uh, that appear suddenly, for instance, for the creation of a national park. It was not really <laughs> planned because we wanted to create a local reserve, but then it doesn't work because the major change and the local political problems. But then we use this information that we uh, prepare and move into the presentation of um, a proposal for a national um, a national protected area as, as a national park. And we achieve that. If we don't have this kind of flexibility in, in our donors, it wasn't possible. So it's very important also this flexibility and adaptability. Local empowerment, the people must to be involved with and uh, uh, reinforcing this, this process. Collaboration, we are working in a collaborative platform. It's not competitive platform. We want many universities, we want many people working together, uh, investing time, money and resources and, and capacities. And we are, we are also protecting not only biodiversity, but also water, um, uh, cultural patrimony, uh, cultures, etc. many more. So this is why I think the corridor has been successful so far. And as one, please. Yeah, what's next? Uh, we're uh, getting to the end of the presentation. What's next? Uh, here on the map, you can see the Sangai Podocarpus corridor and the connection to the south, to another area that we work as NCI for many years. This is the Sangai, uh, sorry, the, the Podocarpus National Park. And we want to create a corridor between the Podocarpus National Park to this other national park in, in Southern Ecuador, that is Yacuri, and then with the Andes of Peru. So we share ecosystems, we share water, watersheds, we share cultures, we share problems, and probably this strategy of building a corridor will be uh, worthy to manage these problems together and take advantage of the opportunities too. That's important. And we're also sharing our experience with other spaces in Ecuador that wants to create more corridors. Next, please. I'm glad I had the chance to share with you this uh, information and experience, and I hope, hopefully you enjoy the area and the presentation. And thanks for your attention. And please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Fabian, that was wonderful. Seeing all those photos made me, um, made me homesick for Ecuador, made me miss Ecuador <laughs> very much. <laughs> yeah. Um, that was, that was really lovely, Fabian. Thank you. We have some, some good questions that are coming in and I would remind you all, um, all the, all the, um, participants, all the attendees put in the chat, if you have any questions and we, uh, we will, uh, read them to Fabian. So the first question is from Paul, uh, from Pauline. Um, I would like to hear about any challenges working with communities living inside conservation areas especially when conservation means possible restricting or prohibiting of their pre-conservation activities. Yeah, we have some experiences in that sense. Um, 
inside the conservation areas, there are not many people first, but there are people. There are people who own the land, who use the land for cattle ranching, for instance, or for agriculture. Mostly is pasture land, uh, what the people use for. Um, so when we go to a place to start talking with the people about conservation, we understand their needs in terms of why, how, how a protected area could be worthy for them, how it, it could work for them. The people is very concerned for water, for instance. Uh, the people is very, very concerned for um, mining impacts that could be uh, placed on, on, on the space. We have this Cordillera is part of the of the Andes, and we are very rich in minerals, especially gold, co copper, copper, and many more. So we have a lot of mining concessions. Fortunately, there are not big mines in the area, but um, there are a local concern to protect against this, this kind of, of um, extraction. So um, the people must be involved with, in some cases, I mean, in most of the cases, the ordinances created by the local governments also creates incentives for the people. So uh, tax exemptions, uh, helping them to uh, improve their pasture lands uh, in a kind of um, trade, a trade-off um, between production in this place, improving, we improve this, the production in this place, but you conserve this other place, protect the area that is not useful for, um, for uh, cattle ranching, for instance. The people here, as you say in the, in the, in the pictures, um, the area is very steep and slope. So the cattle ranching are not uh, the best use of the land for, for, for some of the areas. So you can be more productive in flatter areas. So the properties must be well managed. And this is part of the, um, the agreements with the local people. So municipalities invest on conservation agreements, municipalities uh, create their own funds, funds, municipalities and water funds, for instance, that are, are a figure of um, financing leverage funds to this local uh, management. So people must be invo in, involved and we also have a lot of um, care of um, not um, uh, damage the people, not uh, increase the poverty of the people. We want to create more uh, facilities, more uh, possibilities for these people. This is, this is part of our work too, working with production. So it's a lot of, of um, strategies that you have to mix, to combine, to uh, get a conservation area. Thank you, Fabian. That was the most comprehensive answer to a question that I've heard in a, in a very long time. That's a, that's a wonderful answer. Um, just very quickly, um, someone asked about if, if uh, she missed part of the presentation uh, if she could get a recording and yes we will be sending out a recording of the presentation on thursday so uh, stay tuned for that roy asks are there programs monitoring changes in populations of amphibians birds or other species not yet but we during the last three years we established a group of work this is part of uh, the strategies of managing of the area so we create groups of interest with universities, local governments, and many more people uh, to uh, research and monitoring of species is one of these uh, groups. So we monitor species by camera traps. Uh, we put together from several institutions that previously worked alone, now are working together in a network in the corridor and establish this same methodology, establish um, the areas of analysis and uh, gather information from, from the field with camera traps, for instance, for large mammals. We are, uh, this year we are starting a group for monitoring birds and especially uh, migratory birds. 
And amphibians, uh, this is certainly one of the most promising groups, promissory groups, um, to have information of, for instance, climate change. So during the next years, we are we will be gathering information and monitoring some special populations of these species. And uh, uh, probably we will have some kind of indicators of climate change using this uh, as uh, uh, these species. Yeah. Michael asks about, are there um, Achuar indigenous uh, populations, uh, uh, nationalities in this, uh, in this corridor? I would expand that to to ask what are the indigenous nationalities in this in this corridor, Fabian? Yeah, mainly the people in the corridor is um, mestizo mestizo people, so it's not part of the indigenous culture except in southern, in the south uh, eastern of the corridor, in Zamora province, where we have the Saraguro uh, community. So this this people is uh, normally. Um, the origin is the Andes. They came from Bolivia with the Incas. You know, the Incas had this tradition of moving uh, communities to colonize other spaces. So they came with the Incas established in Southern Ecuador. And like maybe 60, 70 years ago, they start to go into the Shuar territory. The Shuar uh, are um, um, Amazon community very ancient community from the Amazon. And the, the Saraguros are now occupying some of the spaces of the Shuar community. So this is the only uh, ancient community we have on, in, in the corridor. They are mainly cattle ranchers now. Thank you, Fabian. Um, where are other areas of South America where there are corridors, conservation corridors being formed? Uh, well, the corridors are a, stri a strategy um, that comes from many, many years ago, I would say. So the, um, especially the, the theory and international cooperation comes to a country with uh, this idea of forming a corridor they say this will be the corridor, but then, then when the the uh, the project uh, ends and the uh, international cooperation agency finishes the, the the project, so there's nothing left on on the on the country. I will explain more. Um, Ecuador is the only one so far, as I know. Probably Costa Rica is is another one. But Ecuador have a special law, a special legislation to establish corridors. And once they are established, this will be part of the land zoning and planning forever. This is a, a strategy of making sustainable these achievements on, on conservation. Because if NCI or any other um, cooperation is not in the territory, the corridor will, will remain because it's already established formally by the national government. It doesn't happen in any, in any other country. For instance, in Peru, we are working with, uh, with our Peruvian um, colleagues to uh, share the experience and try trying to promote the establishment or, or an, of a national law to um, declare corridors. So hopefully Peru will be the next country having this kind of legislation. And it's very important because it's the only way you can involve local governments forever in, because the planning of local governments already um, adopt the corridor as a conservation area, um, communities, universities, and many more. So it's part of the sustainability of the process of declaring a corridor that this must be established by the national government and recognized by the local government. We are getting, uh, this is wonderful, we are getting a remarkable number of questions. If we run out of time, uh, so for those of you who have submitted questions, if we run out of time, we will, um, when we circulate the, uh, the video on Thursday, we will answer the questions in writing because we are getting so many good questions here. Um, what are the sources of financing for this project, Fabian? 
Oh, we have have we have had a lot of very kind people are and institutions, uh, for instance, people of our board, um, uh, other NGOs like a Andes Amazon Fund, um, uh, uh, World Land Trust, um, Bobolink Foundation, Moxie Foundation, uh, and and many many more. Really, this is a sustained process of work uh, during one decade so uh, so far. And as I mentioned, it's very, very important to have them um, uh, and the flexibility. They, they, CPF, the Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund, is, is also another uh, source of funds we had the last year, and um, many more. So it's, it's also sustained by local people. For instance, we have some, we have many, really. It's not funds that, that comes to NCI, but through these projects, we were able to leverage local funds from local governments, from uh, hydroelectrical power plants, for instance, from, for, from water funds like FONAPA that work in Southern Ecuador for Agua is another. We work with two uh, water funds that are uh, sources of, of financing. So local funds and international funds are uh, mixed together to uh, implement conservation actions on, on the field. Thanks, Fabian. Uh, several people have asked about tourism. Is it an important piece of the economy or could it be an important piece of the economy? Uh, and I will fold in the question about payment for environmental services as a potential source of financing. So uh, let me expand that question to, to ask about what kind of uh, what kind of sustainable sources of financing are there, including uh, including possibly tourism? Yeah, tourism could be very important because there's a lot of richness on landscapes, on biodiversity, and communities, cultures, etc. But it's not so far. Um, so Southern Ecuador suffers because most of the tourism gets to Quito and then goes to Galapagos or goes to the Amazon in the northern part of the country. Uh, only like 5% of international tourism goes to the south and few of them are interested in nature. So tourism could be important in the area, but it's not so far. And the sources of uh, income uh, for sustainability, for instance, uh, the municipalities, once they create a protected area, they also create local funds through the ordinance. So the water consumers on the cities are paying few cents for every meter of water that they, they consume to finance conservation. This few cents like could be like uh, $1 or one and a half dollars per family per month this is not that much so but if you put it together in a water fund it's very important to leverage more funds from international cooperation for instance so um, the ecosystem service that, that people is paying now is water is the providing clean water for cities so municipalities have the responsibility to provide water to the people the people is responsible to finance the conservation of the ecosystems in these municipalities that I show you that already we achieve that they um, enact an ordinance declaring the protected area and also connecting with uh, water funds uh, and, 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 and fund resources. Two more, two more questions. One is a question about illegal hunting. Is, is poaching a, a problem in the corridor? Yes, it is, uh, especially when we have problems with wild animals um, catch, uh, catching cattle. For instance, a bear can destroy a plantation of corn or kill a cattle. A jaguar could kill cattle and, and other kind of uh, animals. Um, even squirrels uh, could be a problem <laughs> because they also destroy some of the plantations. But this is the main, uh, the main problem when the domestic fauna, I will say, uh, like cattle, 
uh, it's not well managed. What happened? The people here clears the forest, um, even if it's not their property, because they will um, claim the property to the state. So to give to to receive the land title, they have to clean the forest. It was a law in Ecuador. So um, they clean the forest, cut down the forest, make a, a, a pasture land, put like a couple of cattle there, and then the cattle are living alone. The people is not taking care of the cattle. So they go uh, every 15 years to see what happened there. So the cattle is living in the forest, surrounded by forests. And this forest is connected with other in bigger areas. And uh, so animals like the jaguars, the cougars, the Andean bear are in their homes. So we are bringing food to them. <laughs> expecting they are not hunting on, on our cattle. So it's not logical. So the idea is that the people have to use the land, but have to use properly with an appropriate uh, land zoning. And once you have a land title in the lower part, that's fine. You, you can clear the, the area and make a plantation or whatever, but it's not fair that somebody goes to the forest, clear and space, and then claim the land uh, because it's not need. They don't need this land. They just want the land title to sell the land. This is a kind of a business. Uh, so part of the problem is that they, we are not using uh, wisely the area. So it's more important, for instance, to protect the area in terms of uh, water for people or climate uh, change to avoid to be to be more resilient to climate change, for instance, to avoid these uh, landslides that uh, affects our um, cities or or flows or whatever. So uh, the, the idea is to use the land properly by an adequate land zoning and agreements with the people, agreements with the municipalities, and um, especially be aware of the rich, richness that we have there. There's this, this kind of richness is not in any other space in the world. So it's only here. So this is a, a natural resource that we have to protect like a treasure. Our last question is from Dana and I'm gonna say a special hello. Hi, Dana. Um, what part of your work, Fabian, are you most excited about and why? Well, um, I'm all the time excited by the work because um, we have to be very uh, flexible again. I have to learn about legislation, about economy, about uh, finances, about biology, about uh, communities, cultures, etc. So we, we need um, a bunch of strategies to go to, to make a conservation of these land, vast landscapes. Um, I'm always excited with, when I have to go to the field. I really enjoy this, these areas. This is very, very uh, important for me to go there. Unfortunately, during the last year, uh, our trips to the field were very restricted, uh, trying to protect the local communities from the, the COVID pandemic. Um, I enjoy talking with a mayor, for instance, when I can see that our efforts are worthy because they realize they have the power to protect their land uh, for their people and forever. So I really enjoy a lot when, when I talk with people like, like our friends that are uh, uh, connected now because they, I know they are people that care. Many of them will never be here in, in Southern Ecuador probably. Many, uh, hopefully, hopefully you want to come after seeing this presentation, but I know that um, you care about this area. So I really enjoy many, many of the parts of our work. Uh, I enjoy to be a conservationist. That's, that's why I enjoy it. We do, um, and COVID has put a, a obvious damper on this, but we do uh, in other years host uh, tours uh, in, our, in some of the areas we help to protect. So hopefully we will be able to resume those uh, likely in 2022. It's not going to happen this year, but hopefully in 2022. I want to thank you, Fabian, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I want to thank everyone uh, 
from far away as the United Kingdom and Cuenca, Ecuador for joining us uh, today. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and we really appreciate you showing up. As I said, we will be sending out um, the recording on Thursday and there were a couple of questions we didn't get to, which I apologize. We will include those in the, in the, uh, when we send out the recording. And I wanna thank uh, our, our uh, Mariah, Valeria and Lauren who are behind the scenes. You don't see them, but they are instrumental in helping this happen. So again, really appreciate you showing up and we will see you next time. Thanks thank very much. You. Thank you, thanks to you.